Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to The Political Insider. I'm Brett Smith, your humble host. Joining me today is my good friend, international movie and TV star, the great Nick Searcy. Uh, for those of you who, um, for those who might not know who you are, uh, those uh, readers for The Political Insider, where, where do they recognize you from? Well, I guess there are some very unobservant people with bad taste out there who might not know who I am. But, you know, if, if uh, probably the most popular thing is justified. That's the mm -hmm. thing that everybody remembers me from. Yeah. And there's a bunch of other movies like Cast Away. And I started out in Fried Green Tomatoes many years ago, but you can't even recognize me in that. I was so young and handsome. So. I recognized you in Days of Thunder a couple weeks ago. Yes. Remember that? I, I was walk I hadn't seen I saw that in the theater. I hadn't seen it in a long time and I was watching it and you show up in, in a in a probably one of the funnier scenes in the movie and um you got yeah. Tom Cruise there, you got Robert Duvall, um, and you got the the late great Tony Scott directing. I mean that's yeah. that's a that's one hell of a way to cut your teeth. That was the first uh, role I ever got. Yeah. That was the first first part in a movie that I had. Yeah, top top gun in a race car, basically. <laughs> Good times. So um, you are one of the rare and elusive conservatives in Hollywood and outspoken as well. What's that like for you and what challenges do you face? Well, I have, uh, you know, the challenge of trying to find something to do with my free time because I have a lot of it, you know. But, um, <laughs> but you know, there's uh, there's certain challenges that come with it, of course. But, you know, most of it is just it's people don't come out to me and, and, and argue with me face to face. So it's not like I'm constantly doing battle out here. You know, the people who know me know who I am and they know what they're getting when they hire me and they know that I don't talk politics on the set anyway. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty stable life. It's, it's, uh, it's not, uh, it, it's nice not having to hide who I am. Yeah. 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 I'll bet. Uh, do you, uh, so your colleagues and your coworkers know about your being right of center politically? Yeah, most of the time. Yeah, some yeah. people don't, but most of the time. Well, now especially, yeah, since I've been <laughs> my mouth, yeah. Do they ever talk to you about it, whether they agree with you or not? Most or of they... the people that talk to me about it come up to me on the sly and say, you know, I agree with you, but I would never let anybody know that because it would, you know, I'd never work again or something <laughs> So, so that brings me to my next question. How have your views, uh, how have your views as far as being a center right guy, um, have they cost you personally or professionally? Well, it's, it's possible. I mean, I don't know. I mean, probably it has. I mean, but it's not, Hollywood's not the kind of town where they actually tell you the truth about anything. If, <laughs> if, you know, if you, if you don't get a part, they just go, oh, no, we love Nick, but we're going another way. Right. You know, we're going another direction. Well, yeah, no, going another direction. So it's never like they just go, at least not to your age and to your face. They're not going to say, we're not going to hire that conservative so-and-so. They just, yeah. uh, you know, they change the subject and move on. So, I, you know, it's possible that it's hurt me, but, you know. You never, never have one of those, you'll never work in this town again. Never really had that. I, I mean, you know, I have had certain things where it's like, there's a whole lot of interest and everybody's like, yeah, this is the guy for the role. And then suddenly I don't hear from them anymore. I've yeah. had a few of those things happen, but you know, is there, a, is I, there like a, yeah, I, I don't have, I don't have any real hard evidence and I, yeah. I don't spend a lot of time thinking about it because it's a waste of time. Most of the time, if somebody doesn't want to hire me because of that, I probably wouldn't have wanted to work with that loser anyway. So yeah, no, that's, that's a very good point. You know, I, that, that sort of cuts both ways. So yeah. Yeah. Um, what is it about Hollywood in the entertainment industry that makes 90 plus percent of everyone in it, quote unquote, liberal? Well, you know, I, in doing this documentary I've been doing, we've been talking to a lot of smart people and uh, a guy named David Horowitz is uh, one of the person people that we interviewed. We were talking to him about this and he basically had this kind of concise argument that says, you know, throughout history, most artists have been sort of subversives. Mm -hmm. You know, they sort of have been counterculture people. But, you know, since uh, the 40s, when the kind of the actors got the balance of power back from the studios and they kind of been running the show out here, since they're naturally conditioned to being subversive, to sort of subvert the traditional paradigm and, and attack the foundations in order to be edgy or whatever, they, they kind of wind up being 
you know, what they think is counterculture. But what's happened now is that they're really the culture. You know, we we are the ones. The conservatives are the ones that are the protesters now. Really, we're the we're the sex pistols. We're the people shaking everything up. Yep. not them. They're the traditional state leftists now. It's true. I've been saying for a long time that conservatism really is the counterculture now. We are the punks. We're the rebels. You know, we're the ones that cut against the grain. Um, yeah. It's. And, and I've always maintained, be, being an artist myself, I've always maintained that it's kind of the antithesis of being an artist to subscribe to groupthink. And yeah. that's largely what you get in Hollywood is a lot of groupthink. Absolutely. I mean, and most of the sort of the posture, most of the public posturing they're doing, there's certainly some true believers, but there are a lot of people who are just like doing it to get in with the uh, woke crowd that's running the show. Yeah. yeah. And so they're just like, I better not say anything except what they're saying or else I won't get to be a star, you know? Kind of. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, it's, uh, I heard, uh, you know, Alyssa Milano has been going crazy for what the last four years. And, um, I, I just heard this. I don't know if it's true, but I guess they're going to do a who's the boss reboot. So she finally got some work out of, out of all this whining and crying on Twitter and everywhere else. Well, she's, you know, she works all the time. I mean, and that's what I mean. They're, they're kind of auditioning for each other all the time. Right. It's how much they can hate Trump and how many people they can call a racist is like, that's, that's how they get parts now in Hollywood. Yeah. Switching over to uh, uh, politics a little bit. We saw fawning and gushing and praise from Hollywood for Kamala Harris. How does the praise jive with her record as being a super cop? Uh, you know, especially considering that Hollywood liberals oppose that kind of thing, especially right, right now. Well, Hollywood liberals don't really oppose anything, really. They don't have any real principles except hating conservatives. And so it wouldn't really matter what Kamala Harris is. I think she was selected mostly because no one would vote for somebody like her. So they're going to stick her on the ticket and try to sneak her into the White House and they know that she's a completely malleable, principle-free person that has no real convictions one way or the other. And so she'll just do whatever they tell her to do. And so the left wants these operatives. That's why they like Biden. Mm -hmm. Biden is a blithering idiot and, and he, he can barely dress himself. And that's the kind of person they want. You know, they want somebody in there who really doesn't have a mind of their own so they can tell them what to do. Mm -hmm. And Kamala Harris, I mean, she, she couldn't even get 3% of the vote in California, where she's from, in the primaries. And they suddenly make her the vice president? It, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. I, I think you're right. I think the only reason why they chose both of them is because they're incredibly malleable and they can just sort of mold and shape them into whatever they want. Yeah. Yeah. You know? it, I, I, don't, I don't see the reason for it. There's another friend of mine that has a theory that basically they know they're going to lose. So they're just getting rid of some dead weight that they know could never win an election on their own anyway. I, so I, they waste Joe Biden and they waste Kamala Harris on this election. They haven't lost anything. Those people weren't ever going to win anyway. I, I think that's a very deft observation. I've, I've felt sort of the same way because, you know, we've seen that kind of happens in politics. It seems like it seems yeah. like sort of these, these cyclical cycle, you know, these cycles that come around and you've got sort of these uh, old guard that just need to be pushed out. Right. It's, it happened with Bob Dole. It happened with John McCain. It's like they knew they weren't going to win that election. So let the old guy run and let's get it over with. Uh, Romney might even be, uh, you, yeah. know, you know, in that column too. <laughs> well, Romney didn't even try to win. So. No. <laughs> well, it's like he tried in that first debate and everybody went wild, you know, yeah. after that first debate when he really gave Obama a shellacking. And then after that, it's like he just gave up. I think somebody got to him. I think basically there's some, you know, there's some fairly nefarious things going on here and there. So it wouldn't surprise me if uh, somebody said, you know, that's a that's a really nice thing you've got going there, Mr. Romney. It'd be a shame if something happened to it. Yeah, it, it reminds me of sort of what happened to Perot, you know, back in the day as well. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, my, my, my folks always said that somebody got to him. Yeah, suddenly drops out for some unknown reason. You know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So in recent years, we've seen some hugely successful films that are conservative. Uh, your own film, Gosnell, you've got Unplanned, uh, and of course, Passion of the Christ. Are, you know, is Hollywood missing a huge profit opportunity by not producing more conservative movies, or at least 
appealing to the 60 to 70 million Trump voters in that great unwash in what they call flyover country in the center of the country. Yeah, they are. And, and I think the reason they're doing that is, is what they tend to do. Like I said, they're all kind of trying to impress each other now. They're not really making movies for an audience. They're making movies to impress the person next to them so that they can get their next job. So what they do to try to, you know, address this uh, huge conservative audience out there is they create these faith-based film divisions so that they can basically put it in a box over there and say, you know, that's not us, but we're going to make some of these films because we think we can make some money off of these rubes out there in the middle of the country. And so by doing that, what they do is, is marginalize it. They, they sort of say, these aren't our real mainstream movies, but the stupid Christians out there will like it. And we might, we might make a little money on it. So what I think what has to happen is that really the conservatives have to start understanding that we have to take the mainstream of culture back. And the only way to do that is to create programming and create a delivery system. And because that's where they have it all sewed up in Hollywood, they, they create the programming and they control the distribution. And if you create programming that they don't like, they just put it in a box and don't show, don't push it or they don't show it at all. So we have to we have to create our own system now. Yeah. Content and distribution. I totally agree. I think that's crucial. And that way we're not dependent on a bunch of people who own platforms that basically hate our guts. Right. And yeah. now it's time to do it because Hollywood has basically cut its own throat. I mean, they have so embraced this whole COVID-19 thing that they basically shut down their whole industry. And, and that without even knowing how they're ever going to get it back. I mean, I, I don't know how they're going to start up again with all these rules that uh, the Screen Actors Guild and the Teamsters have put out. It's like, I don't know how you make a movie with those rules. We'll see what happens. <laughs> I, I got a feeling everybody's going to be standing like everybody's just going to be composited in. They're going to shoot everybody individually and then just, or green screen the whole thing or do everything. I'll just do all this uh, stuff in post. Yeah. You, you know, I'm supposed to do a movie coming up in September and I was talking to the producer. I go, what are you going to do? Is it going to be, he was like, tell me you have to test the crew every day. And I'm like, well, what do you do? You have a third string cameraman. Is it like a football team? Right. It's the, gets the virus. You got to put in the third stringer. I mean, how are you going to make a movie that way? Well, and, and Hollywood, move, I mean, usually movie making, you try and move pretty fast. Yeah. You know, so it, I, it makes every day longer. It makes lunch is a big pain in the ass because you can't, yeah. you know, you can't eat together. You know, they have to give you some self-contained little styrofoam thing, which, by the way, I guess styrofoam is not killing the environment anymore. Everything's in styrofoam now. I guess no matter what, it's like you, you need that in styrofoam. I miss styrofoam, so that uh, so I'm happy to hear that it's coming back. You know, yeah. I, I remember back in the '80s and the '90s where you went through McDonald's and everything was in the styrofoam, and your food actually came out hot. Yes. You know, and then yeah, and then cr crushing that destroyed the ozone layer, so we got rid of all that stuff, and now styrofoam is going to come and save us from COVID. So that's there's, there's some irony in that, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, COVID has basically cured cancer and heart attack because nobody's dying of that anymore. They're all dying of the COVID. And it's also brought back styrofoam and plastic. It's just like that guy in Florida that died in a motorcycle crash and he tested positive for COVID. So they, so he was marked down as dying from COVID. It's, it's yeah. unbelievable. This I thing. guess he wouldn't have laid that bike down if he <laughs> had the COVID. It's, it's, it's so true. So um, what, I know, I know this is a long shot, but what is your prediction for 2020 at, at right now at this stage? What do you, what do you think is going to happen in November? We're going to win in a landslide, but the Democrats are never going to concede the election and they're going to fight it and keep fighting it and keep trying to count votes until they think they have enough to win. And that's that's they're never going to accept it if they lose. And they're going to try everything they can to claim that it was illegitimate, just like they did the last time. Did you see um, what Hillary said today? She no, I, I never to look at what Hillary said. I have to. I because I, it's part of my homework. But uh, she said Joe Biden should not concede under any circumstances, and she said he's got to get out there with his lawyers. And you know, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, 
this is going to be 2020 or 2000 Bush Gore all over again with the, the chads and the counting. I mean, what was that? We went like 30 days back then oh, yeah. without knowing who the hell the president was. Yeah, and it's going to be that again. And, and, and basically the left has taken over the Democrat Party and the left really wants to do away with elections. They want to get rid of the whole idea of elections. They're trying to delegitimize them and make them meaningless. And, ba and they've done that here in California. I mean, they've made a, a system out here in California where it's almost impossible for a Republican to even get on the ballot in the general election because they pass that stupid like top two law. So the top two vote getters run in the in the primary run in the general, even if it's two Democrats. So I, I don't, th I, I don't do think all over the country. Well, and I don't think there's one Republican in 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 uh, a position of power you know, that's, that's elected in California right now. I don't think there's one There's a, I, on a local, on a local level. I don't mean, you know, in, in the house, no. we got a couple in there, but, but it's, it's just a monolithic, yeah. uh, one party rule. Yeah. The place is you run know? by Democrats and that's, that's why it's in the shape it's in. Yeah. That's so sad, man. I mean, the place is, it's, I've always said California is a virtual Eden. I mean, when you can go from the beach to the snow, you know, yeah. within two hours, I mean, it's just, it's the most amazing state probably in the union. Um, and yep. it's just been completely ruined by Democrats and leftists. Completely ruined. And it's like, that's the thing. The weather's so good here. You just walk outside every day and go, man, the taxes suck and the environment sucks and everything sucks, but it's a nice day, isn't it? <laughs> I had a hard time getting any word. I, I lived in Venice beach for a while and then down in Palm Springs for a couple of years. And, and it was, uh, it was very hard to not just want to go out and go have a beer and just chill out outside. I mean, it is so yeah. awesome. Yeah. So I, I hear you. So, um, so let's talk about your new documentary. Um, uh, cause, uh, you sent me this trailer the other day and it looks fantastic. Uh, I'm going to link to it in this video so everybody can check it out, but what's it called? And, um, and tell us about it. Well, it's called uh, America, America, God shed his grace on me, which is, uh, the title that, um, the company that is producing it is the Western Conservative Summit. And it's really the first documentary they've ever made. And they're making it to replace their live conference, which they have every year in Denver, which they can't really have this year because of the stupid virus or whatever. So they're making this movie instead. And uh, basically it's an exploration of the relationship between God and America, how important God was in the founding, and how we systematically, the left throughout the uh, decades has tried to turn us away from God, push God out of the public square, and has led to the chaos and madness and godlessness that we see now today in the streets. So it's an uplifting comedy kind of a movie. It's a, but we go, we, we talk, we talked to a lot of uh, really great people. We interviewed Dennis Prager and Ben Shapiro and Ted Cruz and Ben Carson, Alveda King, uh, Brigitte Gabriel uh, and Herman Cain, basically Herman's last interview. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. Wow. And, you know, we did just a really, really. It's been a lot of fun. Really interesting. And uh, oh, you, you got know, you got uh, Bo Snerdly in there too. Bo Snerdly's in it. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's it, and it's it's a really. I think it's going to be. People are not going to expect it to be as entertaining and funny as it is. It, like, it sounds like it's going to be a really, you know, kind of pedantic, prof professorial sort of documentary. Yeah. But it's not. It's, it's, it's entertaining. It's got information in it. But it's also a lot of fun. And there's music and dancing. I, I thought it looked fantastic. And, and you, know, you know, I mean, you're a funny guy. So I kind of figured that it would have, it would have some humor in it. And uh, it, would, it, would have, it would have somewhat of a light touch. It's not going to be, you know, too heady. So, um I, from the trailer that I saw, I, I thought it looked fantastic, and I was just really excited. So, yeah, there's there's definitely some jokes in it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, are you uh, where can your fans check out uh, the trailer? Um, are you guys gonna uh, get a um, some social media pages set up and whatnot as as we get yeah. a little bit closer? Yeah, we're in the throes of really editing right now. We're finishing the film, uh, trying to get it finished in the next three weeks. So I'm not really focused on the marketing as of yet. But the film's going to be released October 10th. Okay. on digital nationwide as part of their um, conference. And they're basically doing the uh, model that the, the movie uh, or the series The Chosen did where 
they're kind of giving it away at, for donations. So if you watch it, you you give what you think it's worth. So I think that's why they hired me because people are going to pay a lot more money to see this space. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know that that chosen series I thought was brilliant. You know, we were talking about distribution. They solved that problem. They launched their own viewer. Yeah. You know, therefore, no distribution problems. You can you yeah, go to their website, you watch it through their viewer. They take the money that the people buy the old episodes, and then they reinvest that in new episodes, yeah. and that's how they're cranking this stuff out. And I was just thinking to myself, what a brilliant way to kind of go around that system, circumvent it, and, you know, technology yeah. and, and just a little bit of uh, innovative thinking. And, you know, and we're kind of um, free you know, to get our, to get our content out to people. So it's a great model and that's the way it's going to go because basically technology has now democratized the whole movie industry. It used to be, you had to have all this expensive equipment and skilled yeah. experts to use it. But now it's like, you know, you can go out and shoot with your iPhone on 4k and it looks as good as anything you can shoot with a $7,000 camera. It's crazy. Well, and a lot of these guys, Ridley, um, uh, Michael Mann, some of these guys that have shot on digital, they go back in and they add the film grain to give it that sort of organic look. But it's, you know, film, what is that? That's like a thousand bucks a foot. I mean, it's expensive. Right. So the digital aspect is kind of, you know, you know, chop, chop that, uh, you know, that budget in half, probably more than that. You so bet. That's yeah. exciting. Well, cool. So, um, so October 10th. That's that's when we can expect this, and we'll probably get some trailers and some previews prior to that. And uh, yeah, I'm sure we're out now uh, that you can find on my Facebook page or on you know it's pinned on my Twitter page or whatever. If you yeah, want. what's what's your Twitter handle? So if if somebody is not following you, they can go and follow you right now. It's a, a yes Nick Cersei Y E S Nick Cersei at yes Nick Cersei. Cool. All you right. At Nick Cersei, yes Nick Cersei. Yeah. That's him. Yeah. Well, sadly, we are all out of time for today. I want to thank Nick for joining me. Uh, everyone, make sure and check out thepoliticalinsider.com and subscribe to our newsletter so you never miss out on any of our exciting stories from our talented stable of writers. Also, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Please like and share this video far and wide because you know that YouTube is going to do everything they can to suppress it, given, given my guest. You know, he's so controversial. And uh, subscribe to the Political Insider channel on YouTube and hit the bell for notifications so you never miss any of our videos like this one. Everyone have a great day, and we will see you next time. Take care. Thanks, Brett. You bet.